Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you this morning. I woke up to the sound of thunder this morning. Uh, that surprised me. So I'm kind of a weather guy, but I have not been paying attention much to the weather lately. So didn't know we'd have warning thunderstorms. And to me, that is both comforting and powerful. Uh, sometimes I hear it and I think, okay, God, you got this. Uh, you know, no matter what you're going through, if uh, you just hear a clasp of thunder, you just stop for a moment and pay attention. You may go back, right back to your worry, but for some reason, the thunder reminds me that God of word stands firm and that God's in control. And despite all the difficulties that we see, the, the Lord has a plan. So grateful for that. And if you hear thunder uh, this morning, um, it won't be from me. Uh, you know, God willing, it will be from our Lord. So, um, hey, let me just say a quick word of prayer again before we get started. So, Jesus, uh, we need you. We thank you that you're with us. And we pray, Father, that you would use these words to not just encourage us, but to transform our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I can get uh, kind of excitable. You know, I kind of move around a lot, move my hands a lot. And so I was having lunch with a friend uh, from Hope this past Thursday and got excited about some point I was making at the restaurant and I hit his glass of water right over the table and onto his lap. Note to uh, self out there, if I schedule lunch with you, you may want to cancel it. It could get messy. Because I am a mess, but David, Pass, uh, David Dwight, our senior pastor, has said, uh, I'm actually an artist. I see my shirt as an empty canvas in the morning and I paint it all day long. But I'm also a church guy. I grew up in a home that talked about Jesus. I've never been arrested, at least that I can remember. And I'm nice to my neighbors. I'm generally conservative in my politics, and I care about injustices. If I judge, I, I judge just a little bit. So I may be a mess on the outside, but I think on the inside, I'm doing okay. I'm a pretty good guy. <laughs> Wrong answer. The Bible says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The Apostle Paul says, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, how's that for an encouraging start to a sermon? <laughs> Honey, I think it's time for brunch. Can we get going early? Somebody put my child's number on the screen. Maybe I can get out of here. <laughs> but here's what I know. I'm ruined without Christ. This is my story. Sin isn't something I lapse into once in a while. Like spilling a drink for lunch. No one would sin if it didn't bring some kind of pleasure or emotional release in our lives. But I also know that we wouldn't sin if it was in our personal power to be perfectly holy. And how do I know that's true? Because the aftermath of sin darkens our heart. Our sin tears apart our soul and puts a distance between God and the people that we love. We walk around with our eyes downcast and less confidence in our step. But even in the midst of that, I'm not sure we fully understand the gravity of our sin. It's a stack of weight we carry and we wonder why we feel so stuck. I think threefold sin is why our hearts feel so heavy at times. There is sin against us personally, someone who betrays us or hurts us or damages our soul in some word or action. Then there is a sin that we commit, the ones we judge in our own perfect politics or pride for me that says, look at all those empty seats at Yankee Stadium behind home plate. You know, that's never true for the Red Sox. It's always full. That's my own personal prideful favorite. Or look at me, I'm here. I paid $5 a gallon 
for gas to be a church. And I wish others would in understand the importance of gathering together like I do. You know, it might seem funny, but these are smaller examples of a bigger problem of being prideful or storing up anger in our hearts. What are the sins that we commit? Then there is the sin in the world that crushes our soul. When children die by gunfire in schools, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all is a big number. Threefold sin is why we feel so heavy. Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says, Beneath our smiles at the grocery store and cheerful greetings to the mailman, we are quietly enthroning self and eviscerating our souls of the beauty and dignity for which we were made. God have mercy on us. And actually, that is what our God does. This is the reconciling heart of our God, to have mercy on us. Our passage this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. And the apostle Paul, who counted himself as the chief of all sinners, said this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith and this not from yourself. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Wow. Some commentators even feel like that's a a poem or a psalm or a hymn. All the, the great attributes of our God who is rich in mercy and unfailing love. This is the reconciling heart of our God. But God who is Rich in mercy because of his great love he had for us. Made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. Ortland writes, Christ was not sent to mend wounded people or wake sleepy people or advise confused people or inspired bored people or spur on lazy people or educate ignorant people but to raise dead people. And that's what we are and we have been. Lord, have mercy on us, and that's exactly what our God does. This is the reconciling heart of our God. So there are two concepts here that I want to flesh out a little bit more, grace and mercy. They feel like cousins in the character of God. They're related, but they're not the same. I try to to put sort of message version or where the rubber meets the road uh, definition on these. Because all of us, if you've been in church world, have heard some kind of definition. But this is kind of what the Lord laid on my heart. Grace is goodwill. A smile and not a frown from the grace of God. Grace is undeserved favor. Grace on Friday night is a light on the front porch that still burns for you after you are running away. Actually, grace leaves the front porch with a flashlight to go find you. Grace is a warm embrace, not a pointed finger. Mercy is compassion or kindness from the powerful to the powerless. Mercy could judge us for our condition, but instead says, case dismissed. Mercy is a good Samaritan who cares for the stripped and beaten on the side of the road. 
Mercy is power and position that takes on flesh to become like me in my lowest state. From the powerful to the powerless. This is mercy. So Louis Giglio shared an illustration at the Passion Conference 14 years ago that illuminates God's mercy for me. A picture of God's love from the one with all the power to the powerless. So he said, if the earth were the size of a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Think about that. If the earth were the size of a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Okay, that doesn't seem to excite anybody. <laughs> so I brought a golf ball. I borrowed this from Louie. I think this is a great illustration to help us understand mercy. Now, this represents earth. Okay, you got it? Find America. Find the United States. Find Richmond. And then where's your house? Put, put, put yourself here on the golf ball. Let, let me know when you found yourself. Did, did you find yourself yet on the golf ball called the earth? If the earth were the size of a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Put up a picture of the sun. This is the sun, 15 feet in diameter. All right? So if the earth were the size of a golf ball, that's us. And that's the sun. You can fit over 960,000 of these things if the earth was a golf ball in a 15-foot diameter sun. You could fill a school bus with these golf balls, and it still would be nothing compared to the size of the sun. And the sun is one massive star in the cosmos, a part of our solar system. It's just one Massive star. There are suns that are bigger than our sun in the universe. And in the beginning it says, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is us. The powerful to the powerless. So Giglio said he had a shrinking feeling <laughs> when he first realized this. But in a good way. You know why? Because our sin has a way of shrinking God down in our mind and puffing ourselves up in our own estimation. I think it'll be okay again. I'm all right, and this is pleasurable to me, and you know. And we forget about the power of our God. But just one glance into the universe and the brightness of the sun or the full moon at night. Where are you? Right sizes. Everything in our hearts. If the sun were the size of a golf ball, if the earth were the size of a golf ball, you could fit 960,000 of these into the sun. This is God's mercy. We worship an incredible God who came to earth to have a relationship with us. God's power could have crushed us when we crush one another in our sins. But instead, God wants to reconcile us this is God's great mercy. And I believe that we have downsized the glory of God in our hearts if we don't see how powerful our God is and how undeserving we are. Peter Kraft writes in The God Who Loves You, real Christianity is a supernatural fire that burst non-being asunder and created the universe. And now it has burst the doors of death asunder and recreated humanity. 
my wife told me yesterday, you know, people generally do have a ticker tape of sin in their head and heart. They don't feel very good about themselves. I don't know where this is going to go. Here's where it goes. It goes into the arms of our God who loves us, who created us in his image and wants to redeem us. This is the grace and mercy of our God. We don't follow a JV Jesus who can't meet our needs. I think we understand that God is with us. We often talk about that, don't we? Oh, he's present. He's with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. But if our God, who created the universe, is present with us, it means his power is also with us. Do not diminish the power of our God. So listen to the text again. Ephesians 2. I want you to listen to it and listen to the attributes or the character of our our God that he bestows upon us. There's words like with him in this. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with Christ even though with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches. In other words, he will point to you, look at this, look what I've done of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I love my people. For you are saved by grace through faith and this not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from work so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I, when I was reading this, I read this when I was reading through the Bible in 90 days. And I, I just started under uh, circling all these words in my Bible. I thought, wow, this is a powerful passage. Here's what I circled. Rich in mercy. Great love, alive with Christ, seated us, raised us, immeasurable riches, kind to us, God's gift, God's workmanship, created in Christ, good works, God prepared for us. These 12 things are the reconciling heart of God for us. You can never outspend the great mercy of our God. Our God is a trillionaire in mercy. I couldn't come up with a bigger number. talking about our sin that we might know how great our God is but for those of you still discouraged this morning for those of you not impressed by God's mercy because your life is still full of pain God knows Dan Orland says the evidence of God's mercy to you is being mistreated misunderstood betrayed and nailed to the cross in your place for now and for all eternity If you can't believe God in your pain, look to the cross. You can hold your damaged heart and your clenched hands in the air again and show him your wounds. He understands. He's with you in the pain. This is the reconciling heart of our God. The one that was born in the manger is not afraid of our mess. Your salvation is safe. Your life is safe in your relationship with Jesus Christ. This past week, we were in a staff devotion, and one of our staff members, Jennifer, a manager at Hope Thrift, told the story of God's power and presence in her cancer treatments. Jennifer had over 23 surgeries in her lifetime. Not all of them related to cancer, but in every surgery, she has known the mercy of her God. I don't have time to tell you all the ways that God has worked in her life. But at one point, she said to our staff, with confidence, you can ask God... For what you want in prayer. But since my 
hearing is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> Sinful ears. I thought she said this. Gasp for what you want in prayer. But that worked for me. Not ask, but gasp for what you want in prayer. Gasp feels like a prayer for mercy to me. So let Hebrews 4.16 be your take home from the sermon this week. Memorize this for your Monday blues, your Tuesday pride, <laughs> your Wednesday discouragement, or your Friday and Saturday sins. I gave you Thursday and Sunday off. <laughs> this is it. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You can approach God's throne with confidence. This is the reconciling heart of our God. Great mercy in our time of need. As we were driving here this morning, my wife reminded me, yeah, forgiven much, love much. You know, we're not the biggest deal in our solar system. We may not even be the biggest deal in our neighborhood, and for some of us, not even in our house. But we are incredibly special to God, created in his image to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And we will look at our role with that next week. So gasp for what you need in prayer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. This is the great mercy of our God. Let's pray. So Lord God, with your presence comes your power. And with your power, comes a gentle hand to protect us and to hold us and to forgive us and to give us hope again. And so, Lord, for this we are so grateful that we can come to the foot of the cross and place our needs and place our pain and place our sins. And you say from the cross, give me your sin. I'll give you my righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please?